all the time. These are interesting days. We've been asked to pray for uh, Christie's daughter, Hannah, a believer who was uh, in a very serious car accident last night. And I'd like to lift her up. Father God, we commit Hannah into your hands. You're the God who heals. You raised your son from the dead. So raising up us out of a hospital bed after an auto accident, all you got to do is say the word, snap your fingers, Lord. And I pray that you would, that you would do a miracle on, on Christine Rick's behalf as well as, as Hannah's. That you would glorify your name by showing the doctors what you're capable of and only you are capable of. We praise you, Lord, for who you are and the fact that all things work together for the good in ways we don't even begin to understand. But we believe you, Lord. We believe your word, and we take your promises by faith, and we give you glory for what you're going to do in this young lady's life, Father, and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd also like to, it's not an announcement, but I would just like to say thank you for all of the volunteers in this church who clean, who help with landscaping, kids, nursery, uh, VBS, the list goes on and on. You guys work so hard in this church. I love you so much, and I am so thankful for your help. You guys uh, teach our church and teach our children by example, and, and you exemplify the heart of a true servant. Can I just say thank you? Thank you. You guys know who I'm talking to. The rest of you, eat your hearts out. <laughs> you guys are greatly appreciated. Your reward is eternally your youthful vigor and enthusiasm and willing spirit. Bless me personally. Bless the heart of God. We love you and appreciate all of the volunteers of this church so much. Can we just say thank you to the volunteers in this church? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. We are in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, if you would like to turn there in your Bible. But before I embark upon an exposition of this word, I would just like to share the briefest of remarks about recent events. I am not a man who preaches current events, uh, but sometimes they have a cataclysmic effect on society and our city and state and country. Violence in our country, state and city, has become epidemic. At 6.11 yesterday afternoon, a 20-year-old sociopath attempted to assassinate former President Donald Trump at a rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. I believe with all of my heart that the recent vicious political rhetoric has ignited such divisiveness in America that it's come to the point that radical elements in our society have seen that as justification for using assassination as a political weapon to advance an ungodly agenda. James reminds us a man's anger, you can make that generic, a woman's anger, a man's anger, a child's anger, does not bring about the righteousness that God requires. James 1.20. Think about the last time you got really mad. Chances are really good you were in the flesh. Really good. That should be confessed as sin. Ephesians says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. You deal with it before the sun goes down. Because things, there are triggers that are out there that can trigger a fleshly response in us and and we have to beware of that. Here's what we can do in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. Paul tells the church in Corinth, Greece, a very secularized society that they were planted in, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And so we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Take captive every thought. In your anger, do not sin. Give that to God. Ephesians, we had covered not so long in our past on our Sunday morning studies, a reminder that in chapter 4 and verse 29, 
Paul encourages the church there. It's applicable to us today. So this is Jesus speaking to you personally. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Because otherwise you grieve the Holy Spirit. Wow. Watch what comes out of your mouth. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all. That's a pretty inclusive term. All bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander with every form of malice. This is a command. It's not a suggestion. It doesn't set a bar up here that you can't attain. You can. Filled with the Holy Spirit of God, you can actually obey these words. Let me ask you this. Do you think that God actually expects you to obey his word? Yes. You must. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. So we can't act Christians on Sunday morning when it's easy and then go out there in the world and pull out a gun when somebody cuts in front of us in traffic and try to shoot, shoot them in the head. Be kind and compassionate to one another, he writes the Ephesians, forgiving each other just as in, God, in Christ God forgave you. I think that Satan is behind this. Satan is alive and well in the world today. And he would like to push every button you have. Understand the, the warfare that we're up against is not fleshly. So the weapons of our warfare can't be fleshly. Jesus said Satan was a liar, the father of all lies, and a murderer. In John 8, 44, Jesus told his religious opponents that were plotting his death. He said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. He speaks when he lies. He speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. The history of murder goes all the way back to Genesis when Cain slew his innocent brother, Abel, recorded for us in Genesis 4. And many have followed in his steps when they've taken matters into their own hands and not dealt with their frustrations in a godly way. God does not mean for any single one of us to walk in frustration. It is not his intention that any of us walk in hatred or animosity. We cannot ever afford to take things into our own hands when motivated by envy and jealousy or hatred or an attempt to cover up some ungodly conduct like David did in murdering Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. It may or may not have touched you personally, this whole issue of murder and violence, but it's so common in our nation today that we've become somewhat calloused and indifferent to it. We hear about a murder and we say, oh, another murder. We hear about a shooting in Chicago, oh, it's just a, another shooting. 18,456 murders were committed in America in 20. 23. But of course, we live in Colorado. We don't do that sort of stuff here, do we? We don't have any mass shootings. We don't have any Columbines where children are killed by monsters. 30,895 violent crimes were committed in Colorado in 2023, the latest statistic. 30,000. We've come to it, accept it as normal. And it's not just the taking of another human life that defines murder. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, and here's where it becomes really pertinent to the follower of Christ. He ups the ante. We know that murder's wrong. I mean, all we've got to do is go back to Genesis 20 and look at the Ten Commandments to know that murder is wrong. That's not an option under any circumstances. But Jesus said in 
Matthew 5, 21, you have heard it said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, he who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Because that's not how the love of Christ reveals itself. Jesus said, Any, again, anyone who says to his brother, Racha, which is an Aramaic term of derision, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, Jesus said, will be in danger of the fire of hell because it doesn't build up, it doesn't encourage, it doesn't edify. And Ephesians already told us, say only those things that do. No slander, no gossip, no backbiting, no trash-talking people and justifying it for whatever reason. Jesus said in verse 23 of Matthew 5, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, you're going to church, and yet you've got a grudge, you're holding something against a brother or sister. Jesus said, you leave your gift there in front of the altar, go first and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Now, some of you did not want to hear that. Some of you have been holding grudges for an eternity. And you say, well, I can't forgive them. With God, all things are possible. Who cares what your limitations are? Give it to God. With God, all things are possible. You've got to come to the point where you believe that to the point you actually practice that. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I won't humiliate you like Tracy did. How many of you want somebody to cry? Well, that's, yeah, okay. I don't want you to feel like a dog. Oh, I didn't win 10 people to Christ today, you know. I want you to give your heart to Christ. He'll give you the opportunities. They come and go and ebb and flow and let God be God in this. But Jesus said, make sure that you're reconciled to your brother because you've already been reconciled to God. We've done the hard thing. We've come to Christ ourselves. We introduce others to Christ, and that's a glorious thing. But are we reconciled to each other? Is there enough of the love of Christ in your heart to love somebody else? Can you let go of the grudge? Do it now. Do it this morning. Feel free to bow your head, close your eyes, and forgive that person that you have not. Well, I don't feel like those feelings keep coming back up again, Pastor Jim. I've not used the word yet. This is a judicial action where you choose to forgive or not. It's like a judge's gavel comes down, and it doesn't matter how you feel about the judge's gavel coming down. The declaration is either innocent or guilty, but it's not dependent upon your feelings. When you choose to forgive somebody, Heavenly Father, forgive them in Jesus' name, even as I have been forgiven. That's a judicial issue. It doesn't matter if your feelings, in fact, I dare to say that Satan will continue to try to prick away at that scab. Oh, you didn't really forgive him. It's a judicial issue. It has nothing to do with your feelings. I'm not primarily talking to the men in the audience because everybody knows that men don't have a lot of feelings. They're kind of dirt clods when it comes to things like that. They're, we can be emotionally insensitive, but you ladies can hold a grudge on into eternity. And I don't know where that came from, but because emotions and feelings are, have so much a seed in your life, you have to fight all the harder. Let it go. Let it go. You say, well, Pastor Jim, I didn't come to church this morning to have my toes stepped on. No, that's right. You came to have your heart changed by the Lord Jesus Christ. You came to be changed in your thought life and your behavior how you act and conduct yourself as a Christian. That's why you came, and if you came for any other purpose than to open your heart up to God and say, change me, you came for the wrong reason. Unresolved feelings. Listen carefully. Unresolved feelings always lead to inappropriate actions. You might want to write that down because this is a curse that cuts both ways. You can choose to say, I'm not going to let my feelings go unresolved. I'm going to give those to God. I'm going to ask for forgiveness, and it's a judicial issue. But if you refuse to deal with unresolved feelings, it will always lead to inappropriate actions. 
addictions, whether to violence, drugs, or a variety of other things, addictions always begin with indulgences. Then those are reinforced through repetition. It's not that a man or woman can't change. They don't want to change after a while. And you're throwing your pearls before swine. Sins buried will always resurface. Harsh words lead to harsh actions. Harmful words lead to harmful actions. A toxic, carefully listen, a toxic thought life will lead sooner or later to toxic actions played out. That's what happened yesterday with this assassination attempt against Donald Trump. If allowed to, if you tolerate that toxic thought life, if you refuse to resolve outstanding issues and hatreds and anger, understand that they will destroy your home, your family, your relationships within the church, inside and outside of the church. Do not ever harbor hatred, bitterness, or unforgiveness. You don't have that right. Christ died to give you the power to deal with that, not harbor that, not stoke the fires of hatred and envy and gossip and slander and on and on and on until finally your actions bear the ugly and evil fruit that they do. Don't harbor hatred. Don't harbor animosity or even evil thoughts about each other because sin will take you further than you ever wanted to go. It will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay, and it will lead you into a life that you never wanted to live. Church, this is simple. Jesus only left us one commandment. Think about that. There, there was hundreds and hundreds of commandments in the Old Testament that Jews had to keep. Just one commandment you have to keep, one uh, commandment that you'll be held accountable for. It's found for us in John 13 and verse 34, if you'd like to look at that. Jesus told his disciples, a new command I give you, love one another, period. Do it. It does, oh, where, I'm sorry, Pastor Jim, I don't, where are the word feelings in there? Oh, well, they're not mentioned because they are irrelevant. This is a matter of obedience or disobedience, and there's only black and white. There's no gray area here. If you're not loving somebody, according to Jesus, you're hating them. In comparison, Jesus said a new command, command, got a military ring to it, as I have loved you, so you must, say must, must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Because love and violence could not be more opposite. They cannot coexist any more than light and dark can coexist at the same time. You are in the light, but if I tell the sound man to kill the lights back there, you're in darkness, and there's no in between. You're in the light or you're in darkness. But they can't simultaneously coexist. The Bible says God is love, and love is a fruit of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. Strive to be a more loving person than you are. I'm not saying that you're not, May I suggest there is always room for improvement? Would you agree with that? Nudge your wife and ask her. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Dear friends, let us love one another. John caught the message of Jesus well. For love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Wow. Skipping on down to verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete in us. Isn't that glorious? I want to be the most loving person I ever met in my life. 
My wife wants the same thing for me. My church needs the same thing from me. The people in your circle need you to be as loving as Christ was. That should be your ambition. Love them. Love them. Forgive them. Love them again. Forgive them again. And that cycle continues till the trumpet sounds or God calls you home, skipping down to verse 16. So now we know and rely on the love that God has for us. His love is not a feeling. God loves you. You got that? God loves you. It's a done deal. Doesn't matter whether you feel loved or not. God says, I love you. Deal with it. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete, mature, perfect among us so that we have confidence in the day of judgment because in this world, we're like him. There is no fear in love. Verse 18 of 1 John chapter 4. Some of you need to memorize that. There is no fear in love. The Christian who's bound in fear has a love problem in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. God is love. If you have fear, it says there's no fear in love. Then if I have a fear problem, I have a love relationship problem with God. I need to tighten up. But perfect love, he says, drives out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect, whole or complete in love. There's room for improvement in your walk. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. Don't you love how direct John is? He's like a fresh breath of wind. Other people have described him as a slap in the face. Subtle? No. Pertinent? Absolutely. Anyone who says, I love God, yet hates his brother, verse 20, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Perfect argument. He has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now, don't get this wired backwards. This does not mean that you tolerate criminal, abusive, or manipulative behavior. God is love, and he is not used, abused, or manipulated. Let me share you that with you. Sometimes love means tough love. Sometimes love says, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. Sometimes love says, I don't cast my pearls before swine. Tough love lets them sometimes bear the consequences for their own choices, good or bad. The bottom line is, all we really have to give someone is Jesus. If they don't want your Jesus, they just want to use you. Understand that. We have them come in every single week for the last 35 years. Homeless people or people living in all sorts of extremists want to come here. They are more than happy to take your money. They are more than happy to empty out your food bank. What they don't want is your Jesus. But the bottom line is that's all I got. If you don't want Jesus, there's really no point in me sustaining your misery by continuing to let you feed off of or abuse the church. And Paul will address that in chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians by saying, if you don't work, you don't eat. Stop giving those guys on the street corners money. Stop doing that. You may be giving them your tithes and offerings. Say, well, I'm giving to God. No, you're not. You're giving to some guy who's going to take that money and go do drugs or alcohol. Why are you supporting and sustaining that? There's guys out there that are half my age, 10 times as fit, and I just want to roll down my window and say, get a job. I did. I did. Why should I support you? And then they got five or six dogs with them. Eat the dogs. Will work for food. No, they won't. I've tried to get work out of them a hundred different times. They don't want to work. They want your money. Being a victim to that manipulation is not godly. It's not compassionate. It's not wise, and it doesn't please the Lord. Stop it. In this second epistle to the Thessalonians, if we could look there uh, briefly at chapter 3, 
It was written just a couple of months after the first letter, written oh, somewhere around 51 A.D., and he told uh, the people there, you, you should expect that Jesus Christ could come back at any time at all. And they, so they assumed, well, he could be coming back like in a week or two. And some of them said, well, then why don't I just quit my job, stop making credit card payments, and uh, let them turn off the utilities because Jesus is coming back, who cares? And that when it didn't happen in a matter of weeks or months, Paul said, would you guys get back to work? Get back to where Jesus is going to come back, but you should be working so as to not be a burden on the church until that time occurs. So Paul writes to correct this error. And in chapter 3, as we close out this precious uh, epistle this morning, he says, finally, good preacher that he is, he's going to ramble on for a little longer. So when the pastor says, well, in closing, what that means is we've got about 15 minutes to go. He's not closing anytime soon. But that's okay because he's probably going to try to reinforce the points that he's made because Paul does. If I look at verse 1 of chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly, the gospel, and be honored as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has the faith. This is interesting construction in the uh, Greek the original language in verse 2, from the wicked and evil men. It's a particular group that he had in mind. We know them to be Judaizers, people that were trying to tie the people back to the law. Oh, being saved and accepting Christ is fine, but you also have to be circumcised, got to keep all of the Jewish laws and rituals. Uh, and they were trying to get people stuck back in the law. That was the, the wicked and evil men that he's referring to. And then he says, because not everybody has, and again, the definite article is there, the faith. Not everyone has Christian faith. In fact, just because you have faith doesn't tell you anything about the object of that faith. There are probably Buddhists and Hindus out there with more faith than you have. But the object of their faith is wrong. It's misplaced. The object of our faith is everything. And that's what he points out there in verse 2. Not everyone has the faith. Not all faith is a saving faith. I've heard this expression before. Well, it doesn't matter what you believe. Just, just matters that you believe. <clears throat> Wrong answer. Try that one getting into heaven. Well, you know, I had faith in, in Buddha or Muhammad or whatever else. And, you know, if your faith wasn't in Jesus Christ, the object of your faith is what determines as to whether you get into heaven or not. And he goes on in verse 3, but the Lord is faithful. Men may not always be faithful. That but that starts verse 3 really puts God in sharp contrast with the, the wicked and evil people. But the Lord is faithful. Boy, I got that highlighted in my Bible because I need to be reminded often, God loves me and he's faithful. Every word he's ever promised, he's going to perform on. Heaven is coming. My home up there with him is a sure thing. I, I don't hope that it is like, oh, maybe it is, maybe it is. No, no. I have an absolute confidence. Every word he said is going to come to pass because he is faithful. And he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. He'll strengthen you sometimes to go through the trial and protect you, literally keep you. Sometimes he delivers you from the trial. But let God be God. When you pray, don't always and automatically say, get me out of this mess. Maybe he wants you to stay in the mess for a while so he can show you his faithfulness as you go through that trial. You've got to be open to that. Sometimes there's going to be a miraculous and supernatural deliverance. Praise God in heaven, but praise him either way. Maybe I can learn more going through the trial than I could have otherwise. Do you remember in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul three times prayed, Lord, remove this thorn in the flesh from me. Don't know exactly what that was, some kind of a very physical ailment. And God said in a nutshell, no. It is not God's perfect will that everybody always be miraculously and instantaneously healed all the time. 
That's a, simply a fact. I see so much suffering in the New Testament. I've seen so many of you suffer. I love you to death. If I had a magic wand, I would wave it over you and go, be healed, be healed, be healed in Jesus' name. If I had the gift of healing, which happens episodically whenever God wants it to, not when I want it to, if I had it all the time, I'd go to Memorial Hospital at the close of service and I'd clean the place out. Okay? Where's the faith healers when you really need them? If, you got the, if they're faith healers, then go to Memorial, clean it out. Then go to Penrose Hospital, clean it out. Go to St. Francis, empty the place out. Then I'll believe that you're a faith healer. I have faith that if God wanted to, he could do that. I wonder how much faith the faith healers have that they could do that. Here's an aside. Don't give them your money. Am I clear? Don't give them your money. Whether people are healed or not has to do with the sovereignty of God and less with how much faith you possess. God is God. Let him be God. Paul had more to learn going through his trial than he could have learned otherwise. Sometimes Jesus comes walking on the stormy ocean to you, and sometimes he speaks to the wind and the waves, and they're instantly calmed. But there is an appropriate occasion for each. Embrace the trial if that's what God has for you. There's more to be learned there than if he were to instantaneously and supernaturally heal you and remove you from that trial. Let God be God. You should pray without ceasing. Do I believe that he can heal me? Absolutely. He is God. He created the universe. He can heal me. And I pray and I pray and I pray and I pray and sometimes he doesn't heal me. The enemy would try to guilt trip me. Well, if you just had enough faith, Pastor Jim. My faith does not hamper God's ability. He is God. I will pray. I will ask for healing. I will, if I had the magic wand, I would waver it over you today. This doesn't work. Did any of you just get healed by me doing that? Well, maybe I need to get a good sweaty hanky and sell it to you for 50 bucks. You wipe it on your face, and then you'll be healed. <sighs> or maybe we should pray and trust God. I will be obedient to Scripture. It says, if any among you be sick, let him be anointed by the elders of the church and a prayer of faith offered up, and let's see what God does. He will heal, but sometimes he does that by taking people home. They're ultimately healed. i got to let God be God. I demand nothing. I pray for everything. Verse 3, the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you, and he will protect you from the evil one. Who do you reckon that is? Satan. In 1 John 5, 18, the last surviving disciple writes this, we know that anyone born of God does not continuously continue to sin. That's faithful to the original language. The one who was born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. Instantly you're thinking, oh yeah, what about Job? Satan sure hammered him. God allowed it. If you read Job 1 and 2, God set the parameters and the boundaries beyond which Satan could not go. Did God instantly heal Job? No. Was he ultimately healed? Yes. Was he restored? Yes. Did it take time? Yes. When God makes you wait, you don't want to hear this either, but I'm going to say it. When God makes you wait, he's building patience in you. Well, couldn't he hurry it up a little faster? He could. He won't. Let God be God. Can, you got to get a handle on this. He loves you more than I do. I don't want you to have to go through that stuff. He loves you more than me, and he allows you to go through that stuff because it's there that you're going to learn something you can't learn anywhere else. Give in to it. Don't murmur, whine, grumble, complain. Just take a nap. Praise Jesus. Eat a hot dog. Everything will be fine in the long run if you just keep your eyes on him. It's okay. Don't let Satan blow your molehills into mountains. 
Compare whatever you're facing this morning with global thermonuclear war. On a scale of 1 to 10, how bad is your trial, really? Perspective. Perspective. And I praise God for the perspective that he helps us gain when we look to his word. Verse 4, and we have confidence in the Lord that you are doing this and will continue to do the things that we command. Hmm. Confidence. Notice that the word command appears again there. Verse 5, may the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. May the Lord direct your hearts. Make it smooth. Make it a smooth path where you look to him and, and trust him. It's a term that is used, a bold figure, for making a smooth and direct road. And it reminds me of what Jesus said when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The word that he uses there, the way, is the word that we have right here, the road. Jesus said, I'm the road that gets you to heaven. And there's in, there isn't any other road. There's just no other road. God will direct as you keep your eyes on him. Verse 5 reminds us, God will direct your hearts into his love. He'll remind you. He loves you despite the trial and into Christ's perseverance. Suppose Jesus hung on the cross and about an hour into it said, you know, I am so done with this. I'm so tired of this trial. But he hung between heaven and earth from 9 o'clock in the morning to about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And he could have enlisted the aid of angels to take him off of the cross any time he wanted to. But for your sake and mine, he endured the pain, the suffering, the bloodshed. He endured that mockery of justice because he loves us. There was something, it says in Hebrews, that he learned obedience through what he suffered. He, he made that commitment to be obedient, though suffering. Scripture describes us thus, they leave then, and Jesus as our guide. He's the way, the truth, and the life, as John 14, 6 says. And he will direct you into God's love. Hebrews says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that does so easily entangle. And let you and me, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Here's the key. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, not ourselves, not our trial. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author, the pioneer, and the perfecter of our faith. That's how he perfects faith in you, by allowing you to go through the things that he does. Because he loves you. He loves you. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That last phrase tells us what Satan's strategy is. This is what he's doing on you today, right here, right now this morning. He's hoping that you grow weary and lose heart. That's who he is. That's what he does. But the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. Not only do we have spiritual weapons like the sword of the Spirit, but we can hold high the shield of faith, Ephesians tells us, putting on the, the whole armor of God. But as soon as you feel like I'm growing weary and lose heart because you're a spiritual person, here's what it's going to sound like. I just want to be home with Jesus. Sounds godly. It's not. God will take you home when he's done with you. Not before. And you don't have the right to throw in, throw in the towel because you are weary and you're losing heart. The answer is Jesus. It always has been. The answer is being filled with the Holy Spirit, putting on the whole armor of God, swinging the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's the only offensive weapon we can use against Satan. If you're not in the book daily, if you're not in prayer daily, if you're not seeking a fresh daily baptism of His Holy Spirit, you are going to grow weary and lose heart. got to tell you, Jesus and His Word are inseparable. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. This is the Word. This is it. In written form, the only way you and I can grow in patience 
is for God to make us wait. You hate waiting, don't you? At Walmart, you've only got five things in your basket, and there's 40 people ahead of you, and they got 453 things in their basket, every one of them. And you're going, dude, really? And, of course, all of the registers that take five items, they're closed. They're all closed. I don't know why. I think it's Satan. <laughs> you and I don't like waiting because we still are in the flesh. You get angry waiting for 10 cars ahead of you at the McDonald's drive-up because you're in the flesh. You get angry at having to wait on God through a trial because you're still in the flesh. They're all one and the same. You know it, don't you? What's the answer? Don't be in the flesh. Be in the spirit. We can conquer these attacks from the enemy. I have observed that the most peaceful, the most patient, the most contented people are those that wait on the Lord. I say wait upon the Lord. Look up how many times that phrase occurs in Scripture, a kajillion times. We, you and I going through trials are not the exception. We too must wait. That's how God matures Christians. So here's my advice to you this morning. Number one, take a deep breath. Everybody at the same time. Second piece of advice, chill. <laughs> chill. I do. Why do you think I wear Hawaiian shirts? <laughs> Constant reminder every time I look in the mirror, Jim, chill. Chill. What does God want you anxious about? So don't excuse anxiety in your life. Well, I'm not anxious, Pastor Jim. I'm, I'm just, you know, like concerned. Oh, that's so much more spiritual. Stop trying to put spiritual frosting on a mud cupcake. <laughs> Call it for what it is. I'm in the flesh. The flesh is weak. Okay, the war and the, between the flesh and the spirit, yeah, it's ongoing. Some days you feel like I'm getting pounded. Other days I'm pounding back. But the more time you spend in God's Word and in His presence, in praise and worship, in prayer, the more victory over the circumstances of life you have. That shooter that tried to kill President Trump yesterday, you, can I tell you this? I don't even know the guy, but I can tell you this. There was no love, no joy, no peace, no patience, no kindness, no goodness, no faithfulness, no gentleness, and certainly no self-control. Because that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's the fruit that God wants to plant in you. The closer you get to him, the more the fruit you get to experience. You neglect that walk, you forfeit that fruit. You head in the way of the flesh, and we see where that can wind up. In a person that is justifying attempted murder. We've got to dial down the rhetoric in the United States of America. Comparing people to Hitler, can I tell you there is nobody in the United States of America that can be compared to Hitler. He killed 11 million people. He killed half of the Jewish population on planet Earth. Don't ever compare anyone to Hitler. That is so grossly unfair and only polarizes the, those that have political views. In, don't do that. We've got to dial down the rhetoric. Take away the words like fascist, racist. Worst names that I can, I probably can pronounce from up here. Can we stop that? Say only those things that build up and encourage and edify. If you have a problem with cussing, you have a spiritual problem. You should have given that up about 36 hours into your salvation. I don't know what your deal is, but if foul language comes out of your mouth, you got a spiritual problem. Deal with it. Deal with it spiritually. Don't try hard. Well, I'm just going to try harder not to cuss. Yeah, that ain't going to work. The flesh cannot defeat the flesh by an exercise of the flesh. Does that just make sense? You can't do that. That's like me saying, I'm going to lose 50 pounds this year. No, you're not. No, you're not. I know you. 
You like your chili cheese dogs as much as I do. You're not going to know. Next January 1st, you'll say it. Although I'm going to lose 50 pounds this year. No, you're going to go to your grave saying, I'm going to lose 50 pounds as soon as I get to heaven. <laughs> Probably true there, but won't be till. <laughs> Verse 6, he strikes a slightly different note there in 2 Thessalonians, verse 3. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you. Boy, he's big with the commands. To keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle. We were not lazy. When we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked day and night, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help. He could have played the apostolic card. But in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work... He shall not eat. So I rolled down my window all the time and tell these guys, get a job. Get a job. Walmart's hiring. You can be a Walmart greeter. All you need is the IQ of a, of a sweet potato, and you can get the job. You probably do just fine here and feel right at home. That's, but get a job. We all did. Every place I go, they got signs in the world, you know, hire, now hiring, now hiring. Everywhere you go. They, you go to a restaurant after church trying to get a meal. Oh, this section is closed because we don't have enough people to, to, to wait on the tables. Really? They can't get help. Nobody wants to work in this day and age. And Paul says, you know what? If they're physically capable of working but choose not to, that's on them. Walk away. It's not compassionate or loving or godly to make them codependent upon you. Exercise more wisdom than that. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Like I said earlier, all we've ultimately got is Jesus. You don't want Jesus? That's fine. That's on you. That's on you. You've chosen to live a life of, of drugs and, or pornography or sleeping around or alcoholism. That's on you. I can love you. I can pray for you. I just can't fellowship with you. I can't fellowship with you. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You just got to put that, that barrier around your house. Otherwise, Satan is going to try to violate your peace every chance he gets. Don't give him a foothold. Don't let evil violence into your house or pornography or witchcraft or drugs or anything. Don't do that. Just don't open your home up to that. That is not compassionate. In fact, that's the very definition of foolishness, according to the Proverbs. Don't want to do that. I think that is pretty crystal clear in verse 6 as Paul says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you to do this. Stay away from lazy people. It won't work. Stay away from them. That's what he commands. Keep away from them. Literally, you withdraw yourselves. Interesting, the verb in the original language is in the middle voice, which means you have to make up your mind to do that or not. God will help you with the decisions that you make, but you are a co-participant in this action. You must make the choice to stay away from those kind of people. Not a withdrawal of all contact, but a withholding of personal and intimate fellowship. Idleness is sinful and disruptive. And those guilty, those guilty of it... The, the, in this case, we're still brothers, but Paul warned the, the lazy in his first letter to the church. Apparently, the problem got worse instead of better because they didn't obey what he commanded them to do. You can know the Bible all day long. If you don't do the Bible, you're in disobedience. I don't care how many scriptures you can quote from memory if you're not doing them. It is the definition of hypocrisy. His had admonition had not been heeded, so he says it again. Can I say it a second time? Stop hanging out with these guys. Stop subsidizing the choices that they have made. Stop letting them guilt trip you. Paul said, we set an example. The uh, 
Thessalonians had not done what he commanded, so now he amps up his correction. You keep away from every brother who is idle, uh, literally who walks disorderly, who is out of ranks, out of step. In fact, Paul gives more attention to this matter than any other in these two letters except the second coming of Christ. It was a big problem in the church back then. It still is today. People come here, like I said, nearly every day looking for a hand up. They don't want Jesus. They just want your stuff. They want your money. They want your attention. They want your sympathy. They just don't want your God. I have no intention of making people codependent upon me or you or this church. It doesn't glorify God to do that. And so if Paul gives more attention to this issue than anything except the second coming of Christ, that's an important issue for you and I to deal with. And I know some of these people, in light of, second, of Christ's second coming, they just quit their jobs and became a burden to the church. Well, pastor, you know, you told me Jesus was coming soon, so I, I quit my job, and, and I, they're going to repossess my house, and, and they're, can, you, can you help me? Sure. I can help you buy a Gazette Telegraph. You can look at the wanted ads in there. Get a job. They're hiring everywhere in town. People try to scam the church every day. We had a call this, this last week from somebody who used to own a phone. It had fallen into the wrong hands, and, and some scammer was saying, well, if you could just Venmo me some money, I'll be fine. Well, where are you at? Well, we'll come and help you out. Well, I can't tell you where I'm at. What do you mean you can't tell me where you're at? Look at a building. Look at the number. Come on. This isn't rocket science. It's a scam. Give me your money. I will never give your hard-earned tithes and offerings to anybody who is abusive or a manipulator or too lazy to work. That's not what you want me to do with your hard-earned tithes and offerings because it doesn't bring them an inch closer to Christ. It just makes them codependent. So I've done them a disservice instead of a service. And Paul said, stop doing that. In verse 7, he says, you ought to follow our example. Literally, you ought, to, you ought to mimic my example. You know, uh, John Maxwell, the pastor and, and uh, speaker, once said, a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. So Paul had set them in an example. It's my job to try to set you an example. It's your job to set an example in obedience to what you've just heard this morning. So when you walk out of here is when the hard part begins. This is your classroom instruction, but as you walk out the back doors, realize, just like college, there's homework. There's homework. That's where the rubber hits the road. You ought to follow our example, Paul says. And as we close it out then in verse 11, he says, We hear that some among you are idle that are lazy. Here's the deal. Paul at this time as he writes this, he's probably in his mid to late 50s and he's still doing a blue collar job. And he's saying, if I'm in my elderly 50s and have a sight problem, I have difficulty with my eyes, why can't you guys work? Paul said, I'm trying to set you an example here. Verse 11, we hear that some among you are idle, lazy. They're not busy. They've become busy bodies. They got too much time on their hands. Maybe if they work 40 hours a week, they would have less time to gossip and slander and make a nuisance of themselves. People with too much time on their hands tend to become busy bodies. They tend to become critics and nosy gossips. You know, the, the snobbish Greco-Romans, uh, that was the setting there at Thessalonica, thought manual labor was beneath them. They didn't want to do that. Work with my hands? Are you kidding me? They were too pious to work but they were perfectly willing to eat at the hands of everybody else who was working. Verse 12, such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread they eat. And so for you, brothers, never tire of doing what is right. Galatians 6, 9, he had written the church there and said, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will receive a a harvest, if we do not give up, don't give up. It's so easy for us to throw in the towel, but 
We don't have the right to throw in the towel. Only our manager can do that. And when he throws in the towel, you're home with him. You're gone. Verse 14, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him. Don't associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. And he's already said, don't have anything to do with him. Stay away from him. Don't fellowship with him. Don't let him in your home. So the best thing you can do with a busybody, a critic, a manipulator, a gossip, is to stay away from them. Easy. If gossips and critics and busybodies had no audience, they'd eventually stop or move on and claim church abuse. Pastor told me to get a job. You believe that? Little old me, they should support me. I'm sorry, I'm bound by Scripture more than your guilt trip. But it's always the church's fault. Have you noticed that? People will go from 50 different churches. It's always the church's fault. Oh, the church, this church, that. Well, what's your role in this? You are the church. You are the church. Are we obedient to these Scriptures? Or do we just walk out and go to one of the other 304 churches in Colorado Springs this morning? And say, church abuse, church abuse. Pastor Jim was hounding me to get a job. Critics abound. You want to kind of blow them off most of the time. There's this tale (laughs) of a man who went to market to sell his donkey. Follow this. The boy rode the animal and the crowds criticized. Elder abuse. The old man should be riding the donkey, not the boy. So the man rode the donkey and let the boy walk. And they criticized him again. Child abuse. The child should be riding the donkey. And so both of them got on the donkey, and the crowds criticized animal abuse. What do you do? Finally, in desperation, the man put the donkey on his shoulders, and both of them walked. Then, of course, they were criticized for not being smart enough to utilize their transportation. If I please God, I've done the only thing that's required of me. I can't be a man pleaser. Not everybody will agree with the actions of Paul in this passage or you and I when we implement the commands in this passage. Not everybody is going to agree. It doesn't matter. What matters is what God thinks, and what God thinks is what God wrote. We know what he thinks. We know what he says, and we're commanded to obey it. Pretty simple. Verse 14, if anyone does not obey our instructions letter, take special note, don't associate with him. In order that they might feel ashamed, do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as a brother. Now may the God of peace, ah, may the God of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. Oh. Paul is saying all of our problems will be minimized if we just walk in the peace of Jesus Christ. If my heart is right with God, if I'm in his word, if, I'm, if prayer is my habit, if I live a life consistent with his word, I'll experience so much more peace. It's a peace that Satan wants to rob you from. You wield the sword of the spirit against him. You stay in God's word. You put on the whole armor of God. You trust Christ and everything will turn out just fine. And that's what he says in the closing several verses. Now may the Lord of peace himself Give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is my distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write, and he's got these big letters that authenticates what he has just commanded uh, their church to do. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Interesting thing about idling. Have you noticed, as I have in my truck, when I have my truck, Uh, and it's just idling. I'm not going anywhere very fast. So what Paul says is, if you are idle, if you're lazy, you're not going anywhere spiritually very quickly at all. Don't be idle. Don't be idle. Get busy. Get a job. Don't be a burden to other people. Be busy. Be productive, not just in your occupation, but be busy about the Lord's work. Not idle or uninvolved because just like my truck, when it's idling, we're not going anywhere very fast. And I think that the most dangerous place for a Christian to be is in the back of the pack spiritually. Unengaged, uninvolved, not working for the Lord, not seeking the Lord. 
at the back of the pack is where Satan always attacks his enemies, like the Amalekites did when Israel came out of Egypt in Deuteronomy 25. Those that were lagging behind were picked off by, by the enemy. Those who say, well, I'll go to church if it's not too inconvenient, or I'll have morning devotions if I don't have to get up too early. And I think those folks are easy pickings for the enemy. He'll rob you of your victory, your love, your joy, your peace, and your patience. Be sober, Peter says, because your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He always heads for the easy targets. Have you been watching Shark Week? They go after the elderly, the lame, and the infirmed. You mean people like me? Yeah, that's right. I'm the first target. So if we go swimming together, I'll be eaten by a great white shark first, and you'll probably be spared for dessert later on. But if sharks are smart enough to go after the easy targets, what makes you think Satan's not smart enough to do the same? The weak, the wounded, those that are lagging behind, those that aren't quite up to speed, the spiritually lethargic, the stragglers. I'm, you know, I'm thankful that I've been called by God into ministry because I have to be in the Word. I have to be in prayer. I have to be in preparation. And I'm sure when the Lord saved me, he must have said, you know, Jim, you're quite flaky. So I'm thinking, how am I going to keep you in church? How am I going to keep you reading? How am I going to keep you praying and studying and worshiping? I know I'll make you a pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. But I'm not the only one who's called into ministry. Every one of us is. Every one of us is. Knowing that, knowing the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of God and the enabling of the Holy Spirit, all we have to do is seek Him out daily, every day, every moment of every day, and everything will just turn out fine in the long run. Can we stand as the praise band comes up? Let's stand and have a word of prayer, shall we? Lord, I don't ever want to be a slacker. I don't want to be wearying of well-doing. I want to invest in eternity with all of my time and money, abilities, energies. I know my reward is eternal, and it is as sure as the first coming of your son. The second coming will happen as well. I pray that you would richly bless each and every one of us, Lord, that you would prosper us in the knowledge of your will with strength, wisdom, faithfulness that comes only from the Prince of Peace. There's so much violence and corruption in the world today. May it be outside of the walls of our domain, our home, our church. May this be a safe house because you, the Prince of Peace, are here in attendance, Lord Jesus, whenever your people gather. I pray that the Lord would strengthen you in your trials and deliver you from them in his perfect time. May he cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name.